Okay, boys, we're recording. Timer set. We're ready to go. Look at, look at you, Log, just with all the timers. Oh, note card. I like it. <laughs> we're really getting professional, Thomas. <laughs> L- little by little, dude. Every episode we allegedly approve. You guys usually do. Well, I just tell Logan, we need like better lighting, though. This We're all like kind of dark and grainy. It's that natural lighting. Tanner's got man, it looks way better. It dude, yeah. <laughs> he's got the backdrop, the natural lighting. I got coming live. Are you what are you like? Beaver's oh, he's Oregon? got some lights going. <laughs> well, guys, uh, we are joined today by uh, a good friend of ours, somebody that if you follow or have followed the Pac-12 collegiate sports over the years, you may be familiar with his name. But uh, Thomas has a really cool story, and we're super excited to dive into it a little bit more and kind of hear how you ended up uh, where you're sitting today and how we even got to, to know you. I think that in itself is kind of funny how it all worked out, but Thomas Tyner is the guest today, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Hey, welcome. Welcome to welcome the Mr. Tyner. Podcast. Yes. So let's just dive into the goods, man. I mean, the reality oh, is, uh, and I know you're going to hate that I even have some of this stuff written down, but I'm a guy that likes to know it's Thomas. So I did. <laughs> I did a little research, you know, there's some homework. I know when he says notes, he means stats. I got some stats, baby. Hey, you probably know us, more than me because I, I don't know. <laughs> I, know I was going to say, you're going to hate me for even sharing this stuff, but it's all good. It's part of the story. All I know is none of us have a Wikipedia page. You, however, you, you do. That has yeah. proved to be quite helpful. Uh, if you've ever <laughs> want to know a little bit about yourself, check it out. Thomas Steiner, Wikipedia. You should, it'll tell you all the stats you want to know, man. But... <laughs> How I got to know who you were was uh, growing up an Oregon Duck fan my whole, most all of my life. Uh, even as I attended Arizona State University, I still remained a Duck fan, which uh, created some animosity and quite a bit of trash talking, as you can imagine, amongst friends. But you, uh, you had a pretty, pretty illustrious c- career as a high schooler playing football. Mm-hmm. When, when did you get out of the gate, actually, like, did you play like Pee Wee football or Pop Warner or something? Like, how did your career with football even begin? Yeah, so I, I started playing football in third grade, and I have an older brother, and uh, my dad um, coached him and in me, you know, just in every sport since we were young. Yep. And so I grew up going to my brother's practices all the time, and I was kind of just like the little ball boy, water boy. Um, and yeah, when it was time for me to play, which was third grade. Um, that's, that's when I started. So by the time you entered high school, um, Mm -hmm. you, you've been blessed with some, some natural abilities and talents. What, what point in time, like in your life, were you, were you starting to kind of realize like, all right, I'm not terrible at at football. Um, like things are going pretty well. Like, was that middle school? Was that like freshman Mm -hmm. year? When did things kind of start clicking for you? Um, so in youth football, just about every year um, I would play upper grade. So it'd be like three, four would play together. So when I was in fourth grade, I'd play five, six football. And then once high school came, you know, freshman year, I would play JV football with all the sophomores. And then once I was a sophomore or even when I was a freshman, I even bumped at the varsity, you know, halfway through the year. So um, back when in youth football, I kind of noticed that's when, that's when I noticed, you know, um, I have some talent yeah. on the field yeah. and uh, a lot of it a lot of it too was I was always kind of pushing the weight limit <laughs> and <laughs> so uh, my dad wanted me to run the ball so a lot of it was oh you need to bump up a grade so because the weight limit goes up you know oh yeah yeah so, so you would have been plowing the, the young kids like exactly on the, on the upper <laughs> echelon of the weight barrier allowed for the youth football is that right yep yeah <laughs> that's a great question because i think as uh any parent me included like anytime my kids play sports i always like in my head i'm just thinking like my son plays lacrosse and he's really good but like i'm always like oh he's he's gonna go to college he's gonna get a scholarship like you know my daughter's a cheerleader and i think she's the best like she's gonna go all the way like being the olympics whatever it might be like when does that like is it was that something that you were thinking about as an athlete like you know, at a young age or like, when did you start thinking about maybe, you know, college and, and the NFL maybe? Yeah. Well, I think every young kid that, you know, starts playing football, their dream is to go pro or even play collegiately. Um, and 
that was always a dream of mine as a kid. Um, yeah, I, I grew up in a sports family and that, that was pretty much my whole life, you know, all the way up until college. And yeah, that's all we did. You know, Saturdays we watched college football and NFL. And so just being around that all the time, I've always wanted to go play professionally and then at the collegiate level, you know. So your sophomore year, now, now we're jumping in the stats, baby. Um, <laughs> Did you did you even know this? But your sophomore yeah, year, you you rushed for eighteen hundred in the change yards and nineteen touchdowns as a sophomore playing varsity ball. I mean that's that's pretty solid, man. I mean you look at the NFL like thousand yard rushing season on, and that's a sixteen game season. It's kind of always been the threshold of what would be considered yeah. a good running back, right? Yeah. So 1,800 yards, 19 TDs as a sophomore. We're going to bump up to your junior year. 1,136 yards, Thomas. But you missed six games with an injury, which is interesting because I think this yeah. injury is going to maybe come back into play in the story down the road. What happened mm -hmm. your junior year with the injury? Oh, man, I don't even I don't even remember, but I just, you know, I kind of was just plagued by this curse with injuries, you know. Um, I don't even know what my injury was that year. But um, just getting yeah. banged up, though. I mean, yeah. dude, the, being a running yeah. back, even if you look at running backs in the NFL, their window of opportunity is really short. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, a couple year run rate and most NFL running backs are injured, washed out. They've kind of served their purpose. Like the time mm -hmm. frame isn't very great. So certainly one of the I'd say running back and probably linebacker two of the more difficult positions to, you know, yeah. keep from getting hurt or whatever. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it was. I hated stretching. <laughs> I had a lot of hamstring issues. <laughs> um, <laughs> so is that, is so that some advice? <laughs> is that some advice to some, maybe some younger listeners that are, are playing sports is stretching is very important. Stretching is very important. Usually, yeah, yeah, yeah. Important. usually the kids that loved stretching in high school, weren't the best at football. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> that's that is funny man i tell you as you get older mobility becomes something that mm -hmm. becomes so much more important than i feel like even Seriously. strength you know what i mean just being mm -hmm. able to be mobile and and all that stuff so yeah. now we bounce up to you know by this point in time i'm assuming your junior year you're starting to get some looks from different colleges mm -hmm. getting a little more attention you know to kind of back-to-back -back, very consistent seasons even they got hurt um walk us through what's the process like None of us have been recruited, dude. So what's the process like going through that experience as a young person? Yeah, so I I actually received my first offer as a freshman from Oregon State. Um, and then from there, um, I pretty much got an offer from every big school in the country. Um, but then my sophomore year, I committed to the University of Oregon. So um, very early. Yeah, I committed really early. Um, Part of that was just kind of, you know, I always knew I wanted to stay close to home. Um, big family guy, um, didn't want to go far away from home. Uh, and then Oregon, obviously, they had so much going for them at the time. Um, yeah. And, you know, facilities, coaching staff, um, just everything. Um, but, yeah, it's a, it's a crazy process. And, you know, as a young kid, like 16 years old, it's a lot to take in, you know, when you have – coaches flying in from across the country and showing up at the front door of the school during the day and then <laughs> the principal knocking on your classroom door and telling you to come out of class because so and so is right outside the door you know mm -hmm. it's like yeah it's a uh, it's a lot to take in um but you know i i think my coach coach chris casey my high school head coach did a pretty good job of kind of keeping me level-headed and you know walking me through the whole process so Back to be a lot of that's gonna be a lot of pressure on yeah. uh, a sophomore in high school, man, with coaches flying from all over the country to come come check mm -hmm. you out. Did you have yeah. an idea at all at like a dream school or like where it was U of O the answer? Yeah, well, I actually grew up an Oregon State fan. Um, really? Loved watching Stephen Jackson run. Yeah. Um, then obviously the Rogers brothers, I love them. Um, but I just think Oregon had more to offer to me um because i also 
wanted to run track there, but I never did. <laughs> I realized, you know, once I got to college, it was, I realized that football was literally like a year round thing. And um, for me to play at football weight and then want to run track, you know, and get down, lose 10, 15 pounds where I'm my fastest, that'd be kind of tough to balance. Yeah. Yeah. So at that point in time, I believe it was Chip Kelly was the head coach of the Ducks that had recruited you. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you, when you made your commitment, your sophomore year, coach Kelly was still at the helm of the Ducks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So we moved to your senior year, kind of Wikipedia says kind of a breakout year. Um, these dude, there's some numbers in here that are bananas, man. <laughs> 3,400 yards rushing. Whoa. Senior year state record. It didn't even list the touchdowns. So I think it was too many. <laughs> but in, in a single game against Lakeridge, which, good Lord, did you guys play any defense? 84 to 63 win over Lakeridge. Holy shit. 643 yeah. yards and 10 touchdowns in a single game. On my 18th birthday. What, no no way. kidding. That was my birthday, yeah. Dude, <laughs> cool. that is absolutely ridiculous numbers. I know. Wowzers. Not, <laughs> I'm going to discredit myself a little bit, but. <laughs> <laughs> It wasn't too much defense. I noticed <laughs> that. That. <laughs> that, was, that was a long night. I think that we started that game at 7 or 7.30, and I think, man, we must have walked away from the high school at 11. <laughs> it was just back and forth all, all night. Did you say yeah, 84 that's... to 67? Yeah. 84 to 63. <laughs> oh, wow. Crazy so, score. So the... That's a fun game to watch. Yeah. <laughs> so by senior year, man, and obviously you'd already been committed to, to the Ducks at this point, but – uh, a lot of accolades come your way. State state rushing record, I'm sure, among many other things. Um, mm -hmm. Player of the year, essentially, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know. Uh, lots, of, <laughs> lots of incredible records, which garnered you a five star recruit. Which, if you follow football, five stars is pretty tough to come by. I mean, even even today, there's a lot of great players that never touch the five star mark. So, super highly regarded, uh, Army All American as you finished up the season, what was that experience like playing in that game? That game was, uh, <clears throat> well, just, you know, the, they, they came to school and we did a whole ceremony about it. Just super big deal. And it was, yeah. Um, I also got invited to the Under Armour All America. I wanted to go with me just cause I felt like more meaningful you know, yeah. playing the army game. Um, but, uh, yeah, that was a crazy experience, man. And, you know, I was playing with some of the best players in the country at the time. Um, but just that whole week down in San Antonio, Texas was amazing. And um, I kind of got a feel what, for what a college was going to be like, just being around that many great athletes. Um, but yeah, that was, I don't, yeah, I couldn't even explain it. You know, you have to be there to get the yeah. feel. Yeah. Oh, so, so Thomas, you kind of mentioned it, but you ran track too. Mm -hmm. uh, incredibly fast you know there's a state record for 100 meters really close state record for the 200 um i believe a four a 40 yard dash clocked in or around 4.4 does that sound about right is that your best two eight four two eight was your best ever dude that's some Deion sanders stuff <laughs> people aren't running that at the combine like now dude at, <clears throat> what weight were you carrying around running a four two uh 205 good night wow <laughs> not 205 anymore yeah <laughs> two four two eight yeah i can't remember i watched the combine this year and the fastest guy was like a four three i thought yeah that is crazy crazy fast yeah I, on a bigger frame right i mean that's that's wild man <laughs> um so so that takes you into your time at the university of oregon coming in 2013 year true mm -hmm. freshman and i mean they, they had a good program going so you were stepping into like what chip had started to kind of build from a foundational standpoint and at this mm -hmm. point in your life hunting wasn't really in the picture mm -hmm. yet am i right like wasn't never Not done it before hadn't even no. touched it yet you're mm -hmm. still pretty much focused on football exclusively what was it like jumping on campus as a true freshman in an established kind of d1 program you know <clears throat> yeah it was it was uh, just a totally new experience. Um, college is such a 
it's just a fast paced game, you know, it's way different than high school. And then, you know, once, once you get there, you kind of go through uh, summer workouts and then right, right away, you're thrown into fall camp where, you know, you're kind of expected to know the whole playbook or most of it. So, you know, kind of in my position, you know, coming in as a five-star recruit, one of the top running backs in the country, they threw me in, you know, with the offense right away. And mm-hmm. that, that was hard for me because um, I really didn't know anything. You know? <laughs> trying, to, trying to absorb all the reads and all the calls exactly. without really yeah. understanding the playbook. Real quick, yeah. I want to ask you this. Like, I've always wondered like this. I played through like 11th grade, so I have no <laughs> recollection of playbooks or anything. But like, how different is going from like playing in high school to a D1 school? Like, how different is the playbook? Is it just more, way more in depth? Is it like yeah. the same formations, but just like a lot more reads? Like, how does that work? Mm-hmm. Way, way more complex. Um, you know, it's at Oregon, I don't, well, my high school never did, you know, hand signals. So, you know, Oregon's known for like holding up the big sign and, yeah. you know, ha- having the guy throw all the signs up. And uh, that was, that was new to me, but um, just the playbook is so, so different. So it's like, this is high school playbook and this is college playbook, you know, it's, and uh, yeah. <clears throat> so so that, that was tough for me. The the signs that Chip Kelly was so famously known for, did those mean anything? Um, I don't feel like I'm supposed to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> He's but a UCLA now, who cares? Yeah, yes. exactly. uh, I'm going to go ahead and say it. No, no they did not. They did yeah. Not. More of a decoy. Just a decoy. Yeah. Sure. I no mean, kidding. Dude, Half the half the game, especially in the look at collegiate or professional baseball, is like this trying to steal signs and trying to figure out plays and looking at tendencies. Yeah. And that that was a creative, you know, thing that he brought into the it NCAA was, yeah. that <clears throat> honestly, like a lot of programs ended up copying. Seriously, yeah. He really did. He that guy really changed the landscape of collegiate football. Yeah, in a lot of know, ways. He chip was you know such a game changer you know just kind of the face of i would say no not the face of college football you got nick saban you know all of them but he was he was right up there with him you know he had his own style um just super ballsy you know that was just how chip played but i would say i never never played for chip so yeah yeah i would say though chip kelly's offense is probably the most exciting offense seriously someone can watch Mm -hmm. except for when he coached my eagles and he was terrible (laughs) (laughs) So let's talk through that. You were you committed early under Coach Kelly, the assumption that you'd be playing for Coach Kelly. Mm-hmm. And like so oftentimes happens, coaches change. Yeah. So by the time you enrolled at the university, Mark Helfrich was the newly appointed coach who mm-hmm. worked as a coordinator under Chip Kelly, but nonetheless wasn't Coach Kelly as a whole. What was that dynamic like as far as the coaching changed in your opinion? Um, so I'm gonna back it up a little bit. Yeah, so not, a lot, not a lot of people know this. Um, so I actually decommitted my senior year because oh, wow. I felt like I hadn't, you know, committing at such an early age. Um, I didn't take the opportunity or the chance to see what was out there. Um, so I had called Chip and told him that I wanted to kind of venture out and just kind of, you know, look around and, uh, <laughs> He told me, you know, um, if the if you go take visits to other schools, you know, it's kind of like committing to your girlfriend and then cheating on her, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Oh yeah. So I already committed to Oregon, and now you want to break up with me and go cheat on cheat on me and go see other go to schools, right? And so he's like, if you go visit our schools, we're we're gonna pull your scholarship. So <laughs> oh, I'm oh, like, wow. oh, okay. Um, so I didn't you know, I didn't take any visits because, you know, if I didn't like any other schools, I just lost my scholarship at Oregon. Um, do you think he was uh, serious or do you think he was <laughs> negotiating like heart playing hardball with you? He was holding up signs, I think. <laughs> yeah, right. No, I thought he was serious. So, I yeah, I didn't take any visits. And um, but when I got there, Chip was gone. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but that's, so I, that's, you know, that's just I, how that's how it works. You don't you don't I always tell, you know, new recruits uh to never commit to a coach commit to a school you know look yeah. look into the academic side you know look at what you want to study um 
obviously look at the athletic program, but never, never comes to a coach. Cause it's a business. We, we got to understand that. So. Yeah, for sure. Well, what other schools do you think you would have liked to check out? Had you had the opportunity? Um, I really wanted to go down to UCLA. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I remember I was, I was pretty coach or close with coach Mora. Um, mm -hmm. we, we talked quite a bit and he'd always, I don't know if it was legal or you're allowed to, but he'd always send me pictures of him on the beach and like, Hey, look how close we are to the beach. You know? <laughs> I'm like, it's like, Oh, I gotta go down there and check it out. <laughs> you know? That but campus yeah. in that area is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. UCLA was, was an, of interest, like obviously growing up in rainy Portland, any yeah. place with sunshine and palm trees is definitely yeah. high on the list. Honestly, I just kind of wanted to take a break from school and kind of just go party for the weekend. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Go visit schools. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so 2013 happens. It's your true freshman season and the ducks are loaded with talent in 2013. Mm -hmm. I mean, we'll go through some, some names of guys you played with here in a second, just for anybody that is a casual or maybe a passionate football fan, but you guys had a great year. You, you uh, I think you ended the year at 11 and two, if I'm not mistaken. And you personally had a phenomenal year for a true freshman trying to learn and digest this new playbook. Mm -hmm. um, 115 carries, 715 yards, nine touchdowns for a true freshman. Wow. Pretty incredible. You know more than me, Brian. I, didn't I know, know that. <laughs> I know, dude. That's that's why I'm sharing it. You're too <laughs> humble. Dude. You're too humble, Tyner. That's why. <laughs> it's a cool part of your story, man. It really is. It it's uh it's just interesting. So that year you guys went to the Alamo Bowl, if you remember that. And you uh you remember that. <laughs> you beat Texas, the Texas Longhorns, and you earned yourself, Tom, as the first team true freshman all American, which again, oh. hell of an accomplishment. Look at Huh. Didn't even know that. <laughs> I, I'm being dead ass serious. I, I don't know any of this stuff. <laughs> that is so funny to me. <laughs> so I would say coming out of the gates as the five-star recruit freshman year, pretty dang good. 2014. This is a wild year. Ducks are really build momentum off what Chip Kelly kind of laid the foundation worth work. And uh, this year you guys went 13 and two won the pack 12 and then it was the first year of the BCS championship. So if you follow college football, the BCS championship is kind of how uh, there's a playoff of sorts for the top four mm -hmm. seeded teams. Um, Oregon played Florida State. And the quarterback at the time was James Winston. You had a, a pretty good year. It was a little more challenging because you added some, some more depth in the backfield. So you split more carries. And then there's this guy, oh, by the – by the way, uh, quarterback named Marcus Mariota, Mario. Heisman Trophy winner, and he uh, handled the ball a lot. Mm -hmm. So from a rushing standpoint, he put down quite a few yards as well. But you guys, uh, I would say maybe upset. I think a lot of guys were surprised, but just laid the wood to Florida State. 59-20, to 20, made Jameis Winston look very ridiculous, who had won the Heisman the previous year. And Thomas, you had a game, buddy. 13 carries, 124 yards, and two touchdowns in the Rose Bowl. Mm -hmm. It's like almost a 10-yard average in the Rose Bowl. Is amazing. Yeah. Yeah, that was a – I do remember that game. That was a, that was a awesome, awesome game. You know, it's a crazy experience. You know, you, everyone who grows up on the West Coast or even around the country, you know, everyone knows what the Rose Bowl is. And, uh, you know, never in my life did I think I was going to be playing in it, you know. And oh, such, yeah. a, such a big stage, you know, it was like the first <clears throat> uh, time they introduced a playoff system in college football and uh, to go against, you know, big names like James Winston, um, Florida State, you know, that's, that was such an experience. That's cool, man. It's the granddaddy of them all for sure. Mm -hmm. That, um, that year you also suffered a bit of an injury and I believe you bounced back from it, you know, momentarily, but when I say the words Shaq Thompson, what comes to mind, Thomas? Um, my head laying in the dirt. <laughs> <laughs> so Shaq Thompson played for uh, the Washington Huskies, uh -huh. and uh, I believe it was some kind of a kickoff situation, if I'm not it was mistaken. The first play of the game, I was kickoff return, and then he kind of just blindsided me, and that was it. And it was uh, a, like a shoulder issue or something. 
yeah that was kind of the start of my whole shoulder deal yeah um, that's, that's that's funny though because uh you know whenever i hear the name shaq thompson uh, i always remember him because uh i think it was maybe three or four years ago um he had messaged me on either twitter or instagram pretty much apologizing <laughs> saying, <laughs> seriously saying that yeah saying that he felt bad um and uh he, he was offering me to or he's offering tickets to me to come to his, his nfl games <laughs> no way yeah. how funny yeah yeah <laughs> dude that's wild man but that that obviously we'll, we'll talk about this more in a second but that certainly comes into play into your storyline so that year uh you advanced beyond the rose bowl and ended up in the national championship game against the ohio state university buckeyes who um was uh, boasted, <clears throat> boasted by the running back ezekiel elliott currently the old dallas cowboys who signed a pretty nice contract recently mm-hmm that was a tougher game. Um, I think you guys were shorthanded a little bit, some injury yeah. situations, but unfortunately, you know, lost, but finished number two in the country. And I mean, for a, for a Pac-12 Oregon Duck football team, uh, to this day, one of the probably greatest accomplishments that program has achieved, mm-hmm. I would say. What yeah. was that experience like playing in the national title game? Um, it was just, you know, that was a, I don't think a lot of people can say that they played at a national championship football game. Um, you know, it was just such a big stage, the whole country, the whole world's watching. Um, but yeah, just quite, quite the experience, man. It was, man, <laughs> it's just, I don't even know what to say about it. It was just, you know, um, but uh, yeah, unfortunately we didn't win that game. But you know, still, just to just to be able to say that you know, I, I played the national championship game against Ohio State. Um, you know, even starting in the national championship, saying that you know, that's something that'll live with me forever. Um, uh, wish we would have won; that would have been even cooler. But still, just to just to be there, you know, yeah, it was, was so cool. Tell me this: I always try to compare things that I know. So you're playing in the national championship against. Ohio State. And how many people are in the, in the crowd? Like 60, 80,000? Had to be. Something yeah. like that, yeah. So yeah. what would make you more nervous? Playing in front of 80,000 people or getting up and giving a speech, say, in front of 1,000 people? Uh, I hate talking in public. <laughs> <laughs> All I know is, like, yeah. we do these, like, movie things and we get up in, in front of, like, 250 people and I'm just, like, sweating bullets. I can't imagine going out on the field and having 80,000 people live or watching you from there and but then millions of people across the mm-hmm. world did you ever think about that did it make you nervous no because that's like that's kind of what i grew up doing was just football you know yeah and Dude, i think that's that's what i do but i don't know as far as you know talking to people in public that's not what i do you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't like that not what yeah. i'm good at <laughs> I think that's one of the things that, that makes you so unique, man, is uh, over the years, just following your kind of your journey through football and stuff is you, and you can tell already just talking to us, but you have a level of humility, unlike a lot of really talented athletes. Um, I, I, I know you never really enjoyed the attention and the accolades and the spotlight that came along with just kind of your God gifted talents. And, you know, again, you know, these days you see a lot of young folks that are trying to get that attention, you know, and anymore as social media has grown. And I mean, these kids have got like full-time producers putting together highlight reels and stuff like Don't the most ridiculous stuff, that. right? The, like it's crazy. Commitment videos are the ones that drive me nuts. Exactly. Yeah. Like it's just different. Like your, uh, you, your humility is, um, is definitely what stand, stood out to me throughout like your whole playing career, aside from mm-hmm. just like how talented you were. And so it's, you know, Casey's question is funny to me that I could totally see you being like, dude, I ain't talking in front of people. Like, I don't, <laughs> I don't want the microphones. I don't want the press. Like, just yeah. let me check on out of here and get back to mm-hmm. what I like to do. Yeah. Totally. So after the national title game on a scale of one to 10, <clears throat> how much did you love football at that point in time in life? Um, I think at this time in my career, I was kind of back and forth. Um, I love football, always will, still do. Um, but I think I was at a point in my career where I was 
kind of straying away from it. Um, I don't think, I think just my body just wasn't feeling it anymore. But mentally, I was kind of, I, I don't know. Um, it's always a tough question for me because <laughs> I, I don't really know how to answer it. Sure. You know, with, without making it seem like I kind of just copped out because I feel like that's what a lot of people feel about me is that I kind of just gave up, you know? Uh, but I mean, here's the reality. Like you, you were put into a tough situation. So just to kind of move things along, like you end up not playing in 2015 because your shoulder, right? You, you and your family elected to, to get surgery done. Mm-hmm. And if yeah. I'm not mistaken, maybe or maybe not the training staff at Oregon wasn't totally in alignment with that decision. Is that right? In my assumption? Yeah. So, well, um, before I decided to get a sur- my surgery back home, um, I had MRIs done at Oregon and, you know, it was pretty much just saying torn labrum. Um, but when I was back home, I forgot I was like lifting weights or something and I kind of tweaked my shoulder, but you know, it, it was really bugging me. And so I went, since I was back home, I went to our doctor, um, our family doctor and, uh, got an MRI done. And, uh, I had like a little bone chip the size of my thumbnail, just kind of floating around. Uh, my, my labrum was torn pretty significantly. Um, and so I was like, you know, I need to need to get this done. And cause I, I couldn't, it, my shoulder was hurting. It was, I was in so much pain at that time. So I was like, surgery needs to happen. And obviously they didn't like that decision. Obviously probably because I was going through a family doctor and not theirs, Mm -hmm. but you know, I think as an athlete, you know, I I've really know my body well and I've been in sports my whole life and I know what my body's telling me, you know, I know when I'm hurt. And, uh, so yeah, that's why I decided to get the surgery and, uh, kind of not listen what they, (laughs) what they were telling me. Sure. Yeah. But that that decision really tra- changed the trajectory of mm-hmm. of your playing career, and frankly, yeah. you as yeah. a collegiate athlete, you know, you decided the following year, so you missed all of 2015, and then you decided to medically retire in 2016, mm-hmm. and a lot of people, particularly in Oregon, that are huge fans of the Ducks and were huge Thomas Tyner fans, probably didn't understand that once you medically retire, you're not allowed to come back to that same school. Right. So like you eventually in 2017 decided you wanted to explore some other playing options. And because you're a man of, you know, faith and family and you want to be close to home, Oregon state was kind of that, that potential Mm -hmm. option, which created a lot of probably stress and anxiety for you and your family, because you're talking about two massive in-state rivals Mm-hmm. And transferring from Oregon to Oregon State would otherwise kind of be unheard of. But again, if I'm not mistaken, there wasn't necessarily the most warm and fuzzy um, welcome back ceremony after your surgery. If I'm not, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but after you got your surgery done, <clears throat> Oregon wasn't totally like, hey, can't wait to have you back type of thing. It was a little bit of a different tone, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, definitely. Um, obviously because of the rivalry, but, uh, you know, there's always, there's always the people that talk a lot on social media, but you know, there's always the people that support you too. Sure. But, um, you know, I was, um, yeah, that was, it wasn't a hard decision for me to choose Oregon state, just like you said, but, uh, I, I did it cause I felt like I had to, you know, I was going through kind of a rough time in my life and then, I want to stay close to home because obviously family, but my dad was also going through terminal lung cancer at the time. So I want to stay close to him. And, but yeah, it was, uh, I, I didn't really care to be honest with you. I just wanted to play ball again <laughs> because um, I felt like I was kind of, just, you know, going through a roller coaster of emotions. Like, you know, did I really give it my all or, you know, did I just give up, you know? And mm-hmm. I was like, so I was like, you know, what? I'm going to give it another shot and I don't care where I play. Um, well, I do, but no, I don't care if it's Oregon State, you know. Um, and yeah, so I, I gave it another shot. And yeah, I think everyone knows I only played there for a year and then that was that was it. That's the end of Thomas Tanner's football career, you know, but yeah. Well, dude, I mean, I think the people 
particularly those in the Pacific Northwest that, that loved Oregon football should, mm. should appreciate what you had to go through, you know, like in dude, injuries change things in life. That's the reality. Yeah. And uh, like you mentioned earlier, collegiate football is a business mm-hmm. and, and things change. And, yeah. you know, you, you had limited options to try to stay home with your family and your dad was going through some challenging physical, you know, times of, of his own. And I think you did what was best for you and nobody can fault you for that. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, looking at it as a fan, dude, like how could you not love a local Oregon boy playing at a high level i mean Mm -hmm. oregon as a whole doesn't produce a lot of like division one elite level athletes it's just it just hasn't historically like we got a smaller pool to pick from and here we have a guy that was a highly touted you know running back and you, you did great things at oregon before your injury and then you know life changes man like that's the reality but i think you handled it with class and dignity and uh even amongst a lot of maybe negative kind of squawking out there. You just did Mm -hmm. what was true to your heart and true to you, but you can't take away all your accolades, man. Like, dude, you can always over that. And it's just Mm -hmm. incredibly impressive as just obviously getting to know you too. Like there's not a nicer guy out there and you're like, we've mentioned it before, but you're super humble and appreciative for, uh, for everything that's kind of been given to you or what have you. But um, I just think it's a cra- crazy cool story, dude. You played with some incredibly talented people, again, that are still like thriving in the, in the NFL. Marcus Mariota, you know, DeAnthony Thomas had a stint, DeForest Buckner, Eric Armstead, Royce Freeman, like the list goes on and on and on and on. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, opponents of, of folks that you played with. Like, that's cool, dude. That's, that's a cool part of your story. So I know at some point in your time at Oregon, I believe, you went on your first hunt with somebody like some, a teammate, I believe took you out. Like walk us through what happened in that situation. Yeah. So that was actually a, a family friend. He's, okay. uh, he's pretty much like my second, second father. Um, I've known him since I was in third grade, grew up going to a sports camp with his kid. And um, yeah, I think that was around my sophomore year. Um, he was after Stanford, Stanford game. It was a night game, but he had texted me before, saying that we're going to go on a hunt in Eastern Oregon, um, go shoot some pheasant and quail, whatnot, slow upland hunting. And um, yeah, so I just remember him picking me up after the Stanford game. And, you know, next thing you know, we're in Eastern Oregon, you know, Um, but um, we were hunting out in a town called uh, Riverside, which I'm pretty sure is, man, there's only like 25 people that live there. And (laughs) seriously <laughs> but uh, uh i think it was around winter time and uh it was just so i just remember it being so so beautiful out there you know I was this was going to be my first hunt um and this was kind of going to be my first time just kind of just out there you know and uh but i just remember you know walking through the chucker hills with him um and just having the time of my life man and uh it just felt you know with all the stuff going on with injuries and football. Um, I was just kind of at peace when I was, when I was out there hunting with him, it was just kind of took my mind away from everything. And then, so it kind of just turned into like a weekend thing. Like every, every weekend we were going chucker hunt or pheasant hunt and chucker hunt over in Eastern Oregon. And that was kind of the start of my hunting adventures. So, we absolutely love here and we always ask everybody that we have on here like how they got their start you know luck for us it was our dads you know got us involved when we were younger Mm -hmm. did you know much about hunting before that like growing up i mean oregon has a plentitude of of hunting opportunities but did you know much about it or like what was your thoughts or opinions about hunting um before you actually had gone out um i never really thought much of it you know i grew up didn't grow up in a family that you know ever hunted or anything you know and uh it was something totally new to me um but yeah i just fell in love with it i was kind of mad that i never it took me 19 years to start doing it you know yeah so that that first experience with uh kind of the upland game side of the world Mm -hmm. how long did it take you after kind of that first call it a season of hunting before you really got the the bug to want to like continue to explore and learn more and maybe adventure into like big game type stuff yeah so 
the more I started bird hunting, I started actually watching you guys on YouTube. <laughs> no way. And, uh, yeah, I, I have been watching you guys for a while. Um, and then I, obviously the born and raised guys, just every, everybody, you know. Um, but yeah, I watched you guys religiously and I was like, damn, like I wanna, cause I, I forget which video it was, but you guys were bow hunting somewhere. Um, anyways, it just looks so badass. I was like, dude, I gotta try this. You know, one, cause <laughs> it looks like <laughs> he's hunting with a bow. That's freaking awesome. And you know, it just looks so challenging and it looked pretty like hardcore, <laughs> which I loved. You know, it's just, I think that's kind of just a athlete side of me, just always wanted that challenge. And it's that, you know, when you guys are out there kind of in the backcountry backpacking in, it's like, damn, I got to try this. And so that's when I decided, you know, I need to pick up a bow. And so, you know, living in Eugene, we had the Bowtech Pro Shop right there. And so I went to Bow Bowtech, got a new bow. Um, and yeah, that's when I started my big game hunting started started down the archery journey yeah I, ha I have to tell you um i can't remember what year it was when we actually got to meet you at the uh portland sportsman show but um brian and logan were the biggest fangirls before you came to the booth like <laughs> so giddy so well, excited dude the, so this is how i met thomas is i had followed him on twitter literally as like a fan right like a football fan whatever and I'm not on Twitter ever, but I happened to log in and he had like maybe made some kind of tweet or something. And I'm like, is he wearing a hunter orange vest? Hold on a minute. And I like clicked on his profile picture. I'm like, holy shit, he's wearing a hunter orange vest. Like I didn't know Thomas hunted. Not no mm. chance. Well, then I happen to look and I see that he falls hushed. I'm like, what? This is <laughs> this is ridiculous. There's no way. So I think I messaged him on Twitter. I was like, dude, what's up, man? How's it going? Like, I had no idea. I'm a huge fan or whatever. And that kind of started the, the conversation going, which eventually brought you uh, to our booth at the Portland show where we yeah. had a chance to meet for the first time. And then um, I think it might have been a year later, I invited him out to do some fly fishing on the Deschutes with, uh, with Chell and old Crager. You introduced him to Crager, didn't you? I did. And you, and went, let me you yeah, actually went bird hunting with Crager, didn't you? Oh, he's that done that too, but I got to freaking... I got to tell you. That guy's a it, nut. We this, love Craig Craig. We call him Craig Craig. This, <laughs> there's there's a lot of things that you can do as a five-star athlete, Thomas, but uh, I'm going to point sure. out an opportunity. Don't even, don't, don't even go. <laughs> <laughs> we we asked him said, "Hey man, have you ever rode before?" And he's like, "Oh yeah, you know, I'm good." He's like, "Okay, cool. We're going to like we're going to row this thing across the way, you know. You good?" And he's like, "Yeah, I'm good." Oh my gosh, I was dying laughing. He was doing 360s down the river, just strong right arm. <laughs> oh man, that was Next so thing you know, He's like 300 yards down the river. I'm like, get to the shore, buddy. It's a long walk back. <laughs> so I was like, dude, you can run a 4240 and five-star athlete, but you got to work on your own, bud. <laughs> I know. Man, that was so embarrassing. <laughs> that was just so funny, dude. It was scary. I was dying. Like, okay, oh I'm, yeah. yeah. I'm going down this fast river you know i'm you know like you said 300 down river i'm just you know waiting to hit a rock and do a flip you know Luck, luckily <laughs> it wasn't like a super gnarly rapid section but yeah. uh but we got a we got a pretty good laugh out of that but we had a great time fly fishing uh catching some trout and stuff and you know and then to your point casey you did some chucker hunting with our friends craig and carla and uh it's just been cool to see your journey as you've mm -hmm. kind of got more interested in hunting and and, you know, I think for a lot of people, like what you explained that, that opportunity to get out and just disconnect with the stresses and the anxieties of the world is, man, it's, it's a place that you can go really find yourself and heal and kind of just like chill mm -hmm. out. I know for, for all of us, like there's, there's a huge component of that yeah. into why we got into it in the first place, or maybe even why our, our dads got into it. You know, I know like growing up, my dad was was busy and super stressed out a lot at work and dude he was so different as a person when we got to hunting camp mm -hmm. just totally relaxed a guy that just didn't show up a lot at the house but hunting camp man dad was different yeah. and that always that still to this day resonates with me and uh man being being in a river or just out on a on a deserted ridge top or something pretty dang pretty okay that's not terrible you yeah. know and 
it's cool to see that connection, even even though you know you got a little bit of a later start into it. Mm-hmm. What I think, what I think is more cool than that. Well, that's pretty cool, but your love for hunting and how you came into it, but behind the camera as well, dude. Like I've, some of your edits blow me away. <laughs> And I, I don't know if you've had schooling or whatever, but or you just have the eye. But, dude, some of the stuff you produce is, like, I'm a big fan. Thank you. Yeah. How did, uh, uh, what inspired that in you to, like, film it? So you love doing it. You like getting out and resetting the mind and hunting. But, like, what inspired the filming for you? Um, well, I've always kind of been into photography. Um, I remember my first hunt, I was in the Eagle Cap Wilderness backpacking in solo and i remember just sitting on this hillside and i was like how the hell do i not have a camera and so that was the first time i bought a nice camera kind of spoiled myself um and but you know kind of just watching you guys and everyone on youtube i was like you know you can only capture so much with the picture you know i was like so i was like i need to start you know videoing and filming everything you can you capture so much more and um, yeah, so I just kind of learned, you know, if you know, Adobe Premiere, or like kind of just made myself sit down and learn it. And uh, uh, yeah, now I just love it. It's, it's so much fun. <laughs> well, you have the eye for it, man. That's cool. Thank you. Yeah. Curious, where, where does your passions lie now? Like uh, if you had to pick, would you rather film a hunt or be the hunter? That's, that's funny. I, I went on a um, hunt with Leupold last year. Um, and the, they were doing a film on me. Um, I was a hunter. Um, but, you know, at the same time, I was like, damn, I kind of wish I was filming because this is a pretty badass hunt, you know? <laughs> we're on, we're on yeah. mamas. We're like 10 miles in the backcountry. Like, I want to be capturing shit too, you know? Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> you can film yourself, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, but uh, I don't know. Um, I love hunting, you know? I love both equally, I think. Um, I've always, I've tried, you know, kind of start my own thing, thing where I, you know, tried filming my own hunts. Um, that's hard. So hard. You know? So hard. Self, like, self filming is probably one of the hardest things you can do in the woods. I mean, because yeah. you get to a point, you know, like I, that's how I started. I was passionate about hunting, but I was also passionate mm-hmm. about filming. And like, you get to a point where you're like, what's more important because either you can either drop this camera and forget about filming and actually go try to kill that thing. But if I do, I'm going to regret it because I don't have it on film. Mm-hmm. so it's kind of like a catch-22 but yeah i think it's um it's a good way to get get a start is trying to film yourself because you see all angles of it right mm-hmm. yeah definitely. that's probably why you should just get your brother to come film you <laughs> right logie yeah. well that's the thing i i hate being on camera so uh, i'd rather be uh, behind the camera <laughs> i tell you what man it's it's one of those things that with time you just get more comfortable yeah. with it you know what i mean mm-hmm. like i'm sure it's not unlike what you you know grew up with a lot of attention with football eventually just kind of get used to that component of it because i think inevitably most all people are very judgmental of their own self yeah. harder on themselves than anybody else would be from the outside but dude you're great on you're you're great on camera and talking and stuff you really are you just gotta get comfortable being uncomfortable you know what i mean yeah yeah don't, I mean, don't. Dude, logan's spot on man you have a you have like i think you either have it or you don't you know what I mean? Like you can't train yourself. I don't think to be a, a cameraman, if you don't have like that natural ability to capture the moment and, you know, see the shot and see the edit in your head before you even like, you know, upload the, or download the footage and, and edit it or whatever. Like you have that natural ability and that kind of eye, like Logan says mm-hmm. for, for putting it together. Yeah, it's been cool ever, just to see your progression in that. Don't ever become yeah. just the hunter. <clears throat> because you're i've watched your style dude and you definitely like every other one i'm like oh that's the shot dude <laughs> and like it's, yeah. it seems so natural the way you put it together and you're really good at it thank you yeah yeah it's yeah, fun can't... to watch it's fun to watch logie you know since he's a camera guy geek out on your on your stuff man because you know you're literally just getting into hunting and just getting into f- filming and logan's been doing it for a long time and he sits in the shop and just geeks out over your stuff man i love watching it it's cool Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm a, we, I just did a, I'm working on a film. We just hunted down in Sonoma, California, um, hunting Turkey. Um, but I, I think I, you know, Turkey hunting, it's not too exciting, you know, <laughs> but 
I think I love the challenge of trying to make something look super, you know, exciting and just want people to just engage with the footage, you know? Um, so that's the, I love the project I'm working on now. Um, it was a hunt with Max Fennell, who's like a big uh, Spartan racer, is like sponsored. And, and it, the cool thing about that was he was using an air gun, which is- Oh, no way, wow. Oh, wow. So cool, he had like a silencer on it and everything. <laughs> But um, yeah, that was that was fun. But you know, a lot of the footage is just you know I'm kind of just sitting there under a tree, um, waiting for the turkeys to come in. But, but I think as a filmmaker, um, I think it's that's the fun part is like trying to make stuff look super exciting. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw the the trailer or the kind of hype video that I put up the other day, but um, a lot of people I got a lot of good feedback on it. Um, so I'll have that film hopefully done in a week or two. Yeah, the trailer, awesome. the trailer itself was definitely very engaging. Like you mm -hmm. wanted more when you watched it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you got your first deer recently, right? Mm -hmm. first, yeah. Which would be your first big game animal officially, correct? Mm -hmm. What was that experience like just from uh, kind of the beginning to like finally walking up on your first buck? Um, I would say it was kind of emotional um sure obviously taking a life but uh just having hunted hunting big game for four or five years now it's like it's about time you know and i was like all this kind of pressures came off my shoulders you know but i think um it was just such a cool experience like i was with my buddy um and just sharing that experience with him was probably one of the coolest things. Um, and just being out there in Eastern Oregon, open country, it's beautiful scenery. Um, and you're holding this big mule deer. It was just like, wow, this is, this is perfect. You know? Yeah. Yeah. What, um, what did you experience like pre shot? Did you, did you get like the elevated heart rate and the kind of that like buck fever or were you able to maintain your composure? Or did you uh, just like go back to national championship days playing in front of 80,000 <laughs> people, just like ice in the veins? Yeah. No, I was, I was pretty composed. I, I dialed in and um, made a good, actually shot twice. I made a good first shot, um, aimed right behind the shoulder, hit a little high. Um, then I kind of let him run off. And, you know, I was kind of bummed about it because that's the one thing I never wanted to do was wounded animal but i was able to let him kind of just run off and bed down and then i found the right time to make a move on him and then put another shot in him and then he died almost 10 10 seconds um but i i dialed in pretty good and i think it was just more of you know it's it's finally my time it's been too long <laughs> you know yeah. i need to need to you know buckle down and i did so I love hearing that story um, about the emotions you went through, you know, before and after, because I think that's like, what's so pure about hunting. And I don't care if it's like, you know, when we started, when we were 12 and, you know, shot our, I didn't shoot my first deer for like the first three or four years. And going back to what you said, like you'd hunted big game for four years and you finally killed some, that's remarkable. A lot of people don't do that. And just within four years, but going back to that uh, experience you just explained to us, if it's a 12 year old or if it's a 40 year old hunting for the first time, I think that's what's so pure about hunting is those emotions are so similar across the board for everyone, especially when you've worked for it for so long. And it's hard to explain exactly why everyone gets emotional. A big part of it is, you know, you you've taken a life and that's a big responsibility, but also it's mm -hmm. like you said, this big weight, like it's something you've been working toward and it finally happened. So hearing that from you that, you know, as, as a fairly new hunter, uh, is very reassuring to me of the purity of, of hunting and actually taking a big game animal, man. That's really cool to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. What was the, uh, the, like your first, was that your first time butchering a big game animal as well? Like out in the field or had you had experience a little bit um, with somebody else in the past? I think I've been on kills before, but, um, I was very fortunate to be around a camp where, people these guys have had many experience you know doing this um, kind of mentor you through the process then too, yeah maybe? so I, I i learned a lot um but the i think it was just me and my buddy you know in the morning i, I shot that deer um within an hour or hour or two in the opening day um yeah uh so just so i was able to just being just me and him you know we we're up on the up on the hill um taking care of it and i learned a lot you know just through the whole yeah we 
we did like the gutless method and everything yeah. and you know just dragging that thing down the hill you know it was it was awesome so. <laughs> that's killer so um walk us through kind of what what you're doing now like i think you're part of a really awesome nonprofit organization that um mm-hmm. walk us through kind of like what what it is and what the mission is and kind of how you got to be involved with it yeah so i'm part of a organization uh that lydia and jimmy and i started i think last august um and it's pretty much blown up ever since i think we have like you know 8300 followers now um but uh yeah it's called hunters of color and um our main goal is to get more people like myself out in the outdoors um and then yeah um i always kind of look at it like um you know people like me not really having the opportunity or not being shown that way of life. You know, I didn't start hunting until I was 19 years old. Granted, there are people like me that have been hunting their whole lives, but I think, you know, this is something people like me weren't really introduced to. Um, And I I, kind of look at it like, you know, I never would have started hunting if it wasn't for people like, you know, my family friend um, who got me into hunting and took me on my first hunt. So a big, a big part of our organization is a mentorship program. And that's part of what we were doing in down in Sonoma Valley this past week was we took four, four or five hunters and four hunters out on a turkey hunt. And that was their first three of their, three of the four were their first turkey, shot their first turkey ever. And then one of them hadn't shot one in like 10 years. But anyways, that's, that's kind of what we want to do is to kind of introduce the outdoors to people who haven't really gave much thought to it because, you know, it's, it's definitely changed my life to, you know, in so many ways, you know, I, I, you know, I, when I was playing football, I was, it's such a emotional wreck, you know, just didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, you know, um, gain a lot of weight, you know, but I was like, there's always, there's always outdoors and, you know, hunting was such a big part of my life. And I was like, that's kind of what, when, you know, I was done with work, I would, I would kind of go to outdoors and just find peace and have so much fun out there. So I just think there's so much out there that people haven't seen and people haven't been introduced to, um, you know? So, I mean, if you look at the statistics, like last year um, in the whole country, 90, 96% of all the hunting tag or licenses bought were from white people and the other 4% were BIPOC. And um of that real quick walk us through what that what that means for anybody that's not familiar oh you're putting me on the spot uh (laughs) casey yes uh black indigenous Indigenous people of color color. yeah Yeah. there it is is. i had i had to look it up after i read lydia's article (laughs) yeah um but yeah um where was i just uh, talking about like the percentages of of tag sales like last yeah, okay. year yeah and i think of that you know the four percent of the bipoc i think like one percent were were black or you know one percent i think asian and asian and black were of that one percent you know and um yeah so we just want to introduce that you know just get people into the outdoors more people like us and um yeah well so currently you guys have applied for your 5013c status right as a nonprofit, and you're just kind of waiting that yeah. to come in is that correct yeah it's you know it's been back and forth and, and yeah we've been waiting for a little bit now um so but yeah. once you get that designation that would allow you guys to receive grant money from different organizations or you know philanthropic groups that would then provide funding to help take out exactly. different folks is that right yeah exactly so that's when I can hopefully be full time with with that. Yeah, and, like you guys could pay pay yourselves pay and actually, workers, like you know, and exactly. uh, yeah, quit pounding nails. I'm freaking tired, man. <laughs> <laughs> we do. You guys are you guys are onto something good, man. I mean, I know uh, we talked about it briefly at the beginning uh, before we started recording, but uh, Meat Eater had published an article through Steve's brother Matt that would kind mm-hmm. of, I guess, was. A little bit controversial in the talking points of uh hunter recruitment the, the three r's and just maybe his point was maybe that isn't necessarily 
a good thing. And Lydia, one of the founders um, of your organization, Hunters of Color, wrote a pretty poignant rebuttal article to that. I think mm -hmm. it was uh, super well written and brought up a lot of other good good points as well. And I think that that certainly gained um, Hunters of Color like a decent amount of exposure because I know Steve referenced it in his rebuttal to no. his brother's article, and um, you know ultimately. I think, uh, I, I mean, I think the mediator crew has done a great job of, you know, whether it's on purpose or not, is introducing more people to hunting. You yeah. know, I think any, any YouTube channel that focuses on hunting or any, you know, you know, brand or what have you, I think inadvertently is going to potentially inspire people, whether they be young or older in life to maybe try something out that they haven't done before. I know mm. we've gotten a lot of feedback over the years where people said, you know, I watched your videos and never was really interested in honey, but I'm certainly interested in trying it now. Like it looks interesting. Exactly, so I think, yeah. you know, they've, they've inadvertently kind of inspired a lot of people anyway. So the article is a little bit um, controversial in the sense with the fact that his brother was almost going against the grain of what mediator essentially created. So that was kind of a, an interesting week last week, if you will. Yeah. Lydia, she wrote a good article, kind of lit a whole fire you know yeah but, for uh, sure um yeah that, that was kind of weird for you know the meat eater platform to come out with an article like that you know because i i got into hunting watching people like you guys you know um and just watching meat eater you know it's, that's what he's doing it's like he makes it seem so interesting he talks about you know the benefits of the meat you know just everything and so for yeah it was just kind of confusing <laughs> yeah and i mean I, I read both articles and uh, I was a little confused, but, you know, I have to be honest and I've fallen trap um, to that as well, which I, th I think is kind of human nature is we kind of take a, like a look at ourselves or our lives and we decide what's important for us. And so like we run this business and one of the three pillars that we've based this business off is new hunter acquisition. And until recently when I was talking to uh, a guy over at first slide about R3 and R3, if you guys don't know, is basically new hunter acquisition. How can we get new people out in the outdoors? Well, you know, we've been doing this for 10 years now. And for whatever reason, in my head, new hunter acquisition meant getting youth involved because I have four kids myself, right? So I was always, and I still am very passionate about getting youth involved, but it goes way beyond just like what I see is important because one of your guys' mottos, I think is really important that you guys have on your website is hunting is for everyone, Correct. Mm -hmm. it's it doesn't matter about your your race your religious background you know if you come from money if you come not from money like honey really should be for everybody and so i'll admit i fell on trap to that but just thinking that new hunter acquisition was like how can we get the youth involved which is important but how can we get everybody involved because we need everybody moving forward we need those votes right in congress we need people out you know, buying hunting licenses, we need people out in the woods, like, and that's what I think is so important about what you guys are doing is you're opening, a whole, I, I know you're going to be opening a, a lot of people's eyes to not just what's at the tip of my nose, but how can we get everybody involved? And I think that's what's so important about HOC and what you guys are, are doing right now. Yeah, and I think, you know, I think what's really cool about us is that our end goal is to not exist, you know, it was, we don't, we just want it to be normal, you know, for people of color to be out there in the woods, you know, it's, we don't want to exist at all, but we are right now because there needs to be a voice in the industry. And so I, I love the way things are going now. We, we've caught a lot of attention, you know, Lydia wrote a great article. Um, so yeah, I think things are going well. So if you tell me this, to, go ahead, I was Brian. I say real quick, if, if people want to learn a little bit more about your organization, what's a good place to find information, be it your website or social media or what have you? Yeah. Um, so we have our, our website up, hunterscolor.com. Um, so yeah, go ahead and you know, type that in if you want to find any information. And our, our, yeah, one of our biggest assets right now is our mentorship program. Um, you can sign up to be a mentee. There's applications for everything. Um, the website's kind of back and forth. We're still kind of working on it, um, but there's a lot of information on it. So. But basically right now you could, you could essentially apply uh, to, to help uh, be a mentor of various folks that will come through the organization once. Mm -hmm. There it is. 
application. I was actually in the process of becoming a mentor and I ran out of time, but I think it's really cool that you guys have the option to sign up to be a mentor, yeah. um, but also sign up to be a mentee, you know, somebody that needs to be yeah. mentored. And mm -hmm. I think anybody watching at home, if you've ever had anybody um, ask you about hunting and uh, they don't know how to get involved, um, mm -hmm. hunter of color that have, you can, after, you can apply to be either a mentor or a mentee, which is, is super cool. Yeah. And there's, yeah, a place, there's a place to donate as well, right? So you yes. guys are currently accepting mm -hmm. donations. Again, you're still kind of waiting the IRS designation, but uh, in the meantime, you're still able to receive any donations. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's exciting, dude. It's uh, yeah. it's crazy, dude. It's it's honestly, it's it makes me happy to see. Uh, well, that you you just found this like new passion, right? Like you kind of alluded to it that once mm -hmm. football was a little bit kind of over with, you're just trying to figure out like what's the next step. And it's awesome to see that you found it, you know, mm -hmm. in the the components of hunting and fishing and filming and photography and yeah, you know, kind of re reignited that competitive drive that you're kind of in, innately built with. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm super excited now. That's, I feel like I'm at such a good point in my life. I'm pretty content with where I'm at and the way things are heading. Um, yeah, I just, we're just, we're just waiting, you know, to get that status and hopefully I can go full time, man. It's like, that's always kind of been my dream is, you know, when I started hunting and filming, I was like, oh man, I just, I want to find a way to do this for the rest of my life and uh and finally doing it um and for you know a really good cause you know yeah i think it's uh, it's important to bring up thomas i mean i know you grew up wanting to be in the nfl and and you worked your butt off and it just didn't happen but you know and you inspired probably a lot of kids you, obviously you inspired a lot of kids through your you know your play on the football field but you know life goes on and i always say like things happen for a reason and I'm a true believer in that. And I think you're going to inspire a ton more people uh, moving forward with what you guys are doing. And I think, um, I mean, that's just as commendable, if not more than, you know, playing professional sports. Yeah, definitely. All, all I would say is as you guys are building this new, this new business, you know, just, it, just remember it takes time like anything mm -hmm. and um, you know, time, some hard work, a little bit of luck, little bit of perseverance like you'll you guys will get to that point where you know you'll be able to do it full time just don't get discouraged as you just experience like the process like it's a journey and um but dude, there's no there's no better time to to have this organization than right now and i think uh with the you know the luxury of social media and the ability to connect in so many different ways whether it's podcasts or just networking in general I think will prove major dividends to the organization that you guys have built. And uh, again, like in the meantime, you got to do a little moonlight, right? You got a little work, work on the passion project after the work to just get you by. And eventually down the road, like good things come together. And mm -hmm. uh, there's no doubt in my mind, you guys will, you'll be able to make that full-time adventures or, or endeavors for the three of you guys that have kind of founded it or what have you. Just always, yeah. always remember that. Why? Why yeah, you yeah. You What's guys up? A, a very strong why. So, and please, please always reach out to us. We tell everyone, man, yeah. open books, anything we've done that's worked great, anything we've done that hasn't worked great. Like we would love to help you guys out any way, any capacity we, we possibly can. So thank you. I still want to get you on a hunt. Yeah. Yeah, man. And, and probably, I need, I need back, to kill elk. <laughs> probably back on the sticks too, Thomas, because I know you're better than that. <laughs> I know. I'll be uh, hey. Uh, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be back lessons, out there. Man. I'm gonna be out there back out there this year. We'll talk later, but we'll get you out okay. there. Yeah, for um, sure. Yeah, dude, no doubt. We gotta get you on an elk hunt. I think that'd be so fun. Yeah, I I would love that, man. That'd be that'd be awesome. Um, well, dude, we appreciate you sharing a little bit more about your story, your journey, your your mm -hmm. you know, how you ended up um developing this new passion for the outdoors, man. We love I, I just love like the parallels too between athletics and hunting and that competitive drive and building businesses and as an entrepreneur there's a lot of things that cross over in those worlds and i uh, i i thank you for sharing your your story with us man i think the people will enjoy it i sure i sure enjoyed 
going back and reliving some of the glory days. Yeah. Thanks for uh, reminding me of <laughs> all the all the stats I didn't know about. <laughs> he'll uh, knowing Brian, he'll put that all those stats in a spreadsheet for you, and he'll have them in an email to you tomorrow morning. So you'll you'll <laughs> always be, be able to remember this. <laughs> you, you know how I roll, Casey. You know how yes. I roll. Very organized, very buttoned up. Hey, man. <laughs> seriously, thanks for your time. Uh, just thanks for being who you are, man. Just so humble, down to earth. Um, passionate about what you do. I love meeting people like you and uh, you have a bright future, man. You guys are going to crush this thing and I uh, can't wait to see where you guys end up. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, guys, thanks for watching another episode of the Hush Life podcast with Mr. Thomas Tyner. We will have all his links uh, of his new organization down in the description. Go check him out. And uh, thanks again. We'll see you guys next time. And for everybody on the audio, Hunters of Color on Instagram and huntersofcolor.com on the web, on the Google. Very nice, Logan. Go Ducks, go Beavers. <laughs>